Welcome to the History of the Ancient Near East. I'm Justin Singleton. In this lecture, we're going to discuss Syro Levantines in Egypt, also known as Asiatics, and how they relate to the Joseph narrative. Now, this lecture has a somewhat in depth outline, so bear with me. We'll be talking about Asiatics in Egypt, of course, including early trade and Old Kingdom incursions. We'll also be talking about the pre Hyksos Middle Kingdom, discussing famine, the middle class, and a growing fear of outsiders. And finally, we'll discuss Joseph in Egypt, including a dangerous famine, the move from slave to vizier, and finally, the pharaoh who knew not Joseph. Now, as I've stated a few times before, uh, please excuse any interruptions or background noise you might hear, like dogs barking or kids running through. Uh, just bear with me. In this next stage of the study, the move within the punctular time division of the Brodellian historiography is made from people and events related to Mesopotamia to those related to Egypt beginning with the treatment of the Asiatics in Egypt and how they relate to Biblical Joseph. Now, the historical dating of Joseph has already been covered in a previous lecture when uh, discussing Abraham and his journey to Canaan. But suffice it to say that the historical date of Jacob and his family entering into Egypt, determined through the biblical text, is around 1876 B.C., this places Joseph entering Egypt as a slave during the Middle Kingdom. This does not place Joseph entering as a slave in the Second Intermediate or Hyksos period, as some have wrongly alluded to. Now, the proximity between both Egypt and the Southern Levant allowed that the two regions have seen trade and influences from the very beginning. For example, the domestication of sheep and possibly cattle, spreading from the southern Levant into Egypt during a wetter period when savanna-like grasslands covered what is now desert. Interaction with syro levantines or Asiatics, as they've come to be called in the academic literature, was dependent upon the period of time, the southern Levant acting as something of a northern Egyptian territory during the early dynastic and New Kingdom periods, but almost completely ignored or hated during the Old and Middle Kingdoms. Although Egyptian contact with the Southern Levant began as early as the Bedarian and Nakata I phase during the Chalcolithic and Early Bronze I-A periods, the contact intensified during Nakata II-III, and then reached its apex during the First Dynasty. Now, it was at this time that the state began the use of writing for documentation, and the position of vizier may date back to this period, though this is uncertain. The interregional trade that developed in the pre- and proto-dynastic times, which had allowed for the exchange of you know, prestige goods, gifts, and the sharing of cultural values, well, that continued into the first dynasty. But it was at this time that Egypt decided to close its borders to outsiders. Trade continued into the Second Dynasty, but rebellion caused a declining interest in the Southern Levant that lasted through the Old Kingdom of Egypt, correlating with the Early Bronze II III period in Palestine. Now, if you'll remember from a previous lecture, the Early Bronze II III period in the Southern Levant was a period of growth, where cities began to form, uh, walled cities uh, that got bigger and bigger, better and better, richer and richer. That all correlates to a time when Egypt just didn't really care about the southern Levant and basically just left them alone. Okay, moving on. Sorry about that. Still, although interest in the southern Levant had waned, the southern Levantine interest in Egypt did not. By the end of the Old Kingdom, toward the end of the Early Bronze Age, Asiatics had slowly infiltrated the Nile Delta, occupying the Delta and the eastern bank of the Nile River well into Middle Egypt by the 10th dynasty of the First Intermediate Period. 
Now, it's thought that the Levantine incursion into Egypt during the Old Kingdom period was the result of a long period of climatic changes. The drying phase that ultimately brought an end to the Egyptian Old Kingdom, also, of course, an end to the Akkadian Empire, civilizations in Greek and the Indus Valley, and, and, and lots of other places. Uh, this drying phase occurred all over the Northern Hemisphere and brought drought and famine. And struggling families sought out new locations to establish farms and, therefore, a food supply. These migrations, including the flocks and herds of the Levantines, is known both from Egyptian texts and from archaeological discovery. As evidence from the annals of Amenemhat II, Asiatics then continued to enter into Egypt during the Middle Kingdom. Though now they're entering as prisoners of war, tribute offered by Semitic chieftains, uh, through private slave trade, or by one's own kinfolk similar to the Joseph narrative. The forcible relocation of Asiatics into Egypt, sometimes in great numbers, eventually changed the ethnic composition of the Nile Delta. Uh, moving on to famines, there was a recurrence of famines during the Middle Kingdom, though none as harsh as the Great Famine that occurred during the end of the Old Kingdom and First Intermediate Period of which the latter contained a number of famine-related inscriptions. Now, the Great Famine, due to low Nile floods, led to the collapse of the monarchy, you know, the Old Kingdom, and strongholds in the provinces. And the Egyptian lower classes began to riot, loot, and even murder in order to find a way to feed themselves and their families. Now, the cultural memory of those discordant years no doubt imprinted upon the people the harshness of drought. Interestingly, in the tomb of Amenemhat I, uh, first king of the 12th dynasty, the king is said to have prepared when years of famine had come, so that none went hungry. This famine is the earliest evidence of need in the 12th dynasty, and correlates to the co-regency of Amenemhat I and his son, Senusurit I. But this famine may be separate from a later famine during Sinusarit's reign referred to by a nomarch as years of hunger, possibly in relation to low Nile floods in the king's 25th year. Now, the growth during the Middle Kingdom brought changes in literature, art, architecture, and religion. But it also stimulated the growth of the middle class. In fact, it was at this time that a person's position within the class system became something that could be remedied and changed, allowing for that person to rise through the ranks and into a position of power. This new system came on the heels of major administrative reforms, which expanded the range, number, and particularity of organizational titles, linking more and more people to the royal capital in order to track accountability in relation to documentation. Uh, of note, several examples of Semitic individuals are known to have moved into positions of power, such as the Asiatic and chief craftsman Tauti, a name that correlates with the Semitic name David, and the chief craftsman Epir, a name that correlates to the Semitic name Ephron. Additionally, a number of Asiatic statues excuse me, statues have been discovered dating to the Middle Kingdom, including a two-meter-high statue of a seated man with Asiatic characteristics. Now, note that uh, non-royal statuary of larger-than-life size is very unusual in Egypt. But those rare examples throughout the 12th dynasty are limited to high-ranking families. Unfortunately, the prosperity, creativity, and ingenuity of the Middle Kingdom of Egypt brought more and more outsiders into the land. And the traditional enemies of Egypt, the Libyans, Nubians, and Asiatics, increasingly became a part of Egypt. The prosperity of the Middle Kingdom brought even more mobile pastoralists from the southern Levant, likely seeking reprieve from drought and famine in Canaan, creating two different classes of Asiatics in the land, both slave and free. 
Over time, free Asiatics began, uh, excuse me, became detached from Egyptian rule and were considered enemies of Egypt. A Middle Kingdom fortress being built in the northeastern delta as an attempt to keep more Asiatics from entering the land. Those that remained were tolerated. They paid crown taxes. But the Egyptian kings began to fear what might become of the Asiatics. Still, Egypt maintained close ties with its Levantine neighbors, particularly in the Sinai where logistical support for mining operations were provided by local rulers. In fact, inscriptions at the time record the integral nature of Asiatics working there, um, sometimes even as armed guards, and the continued interaction with Egyptian military scribes no doubt lent toward the creation of the proto sinaitic alphabet for the writing of non-Egyptian languages. Now, although a direct confirmation of Joseph in Egypt has yet to be discovered, several points in a Joseph narrative coincide with Middle Kingdom practices. These not only allow the student of history to understand where Joseph fits into the chronology, but these allow the historian to understand what transpired within the Joseph narrative and how these key facts bring you know, the biblical text to life. For one, a history of serious famine was well known in Egypt, the first of which likely referencing the Third Dynasty and finds similarities to the Joseph narrative. According to the inscription on Sehel Island, it's an island in the Nile River, under the King Djoser, who had the infamous stepped pyramid constructed, a seven-year famine brought widespread suffering. It was the dream of Djoser's chief architect, Imhotep, of Hollywood's The Mummy fame, that revealed the reason for the lack of Nile floods, namely, the ignoring of the temple of Khnum at Aswan. Now, although dating to around 200 BC, the content of the stela may originate from a document dating to around 2750 BC and authored by the same Imhotep noted before. And although not referencing the same famine cited in the Joseph narrative, I need, I need to stress that, that was not the famine of Joseph, uh, it's possible that knowledge of the original document, or at least the oral history of the event, caused the Egyptian king to seek out an interpretation to his own dream. Now, this, and no doubt the social memory of the great famine uh, that had just happened before, likely influenced the pharaoh to seek a remedy for what he feared would come. Now, attempting to find a link between Joseph's famine years and a historical famine may be difficult. Famines described under Amenemhat I and Snusret I may relate to Joseph. Uh, I mean, after all, they, they mention years of famine. But these famines were not only too early for the Joseph narrative, uh, they were said to have been so bad that the people resorted to cannibalism rather than, you know, like a redressed famine as described in Genesis. Notably, there are no famines listed to have occurred under Sennusarit III, a possible pharaoh at the time of Joseph. But if a famine had been prevented... Would they have even recorded it? I don't know. Now, as noted before, several examples have been offered as evidence that during the Middle Kingdom, lower class individuals could rise through social ranks to positions of power. This includes outsiders, sometimes through marriage to an Egyptian citizen, and it includes high ranking positions. Of particular interest, the before-mentioned two-meter-tall statue of a seated Asiatic found at Tel El Daba, uh, well, that may date to the time of Joseph, Middle Bronze 2, A through B. The statue, which appears to have been purposefully smashed, was partially discovered in a robber's pit that had been dug into the chamber in order to remove the grave goods, and even the body, which is not typical at all. Noteworthy is the fact that the complex appears to have originally been a type of villa for a high-ranking official, 
and that official was likely the individual who had been buried in Tomb 1, the oldest at the burial site. Now, whether this villa, which appears to match the style of the Levantine four-room house, belonged to Joseph or not is impossible to ascertain, but the, the, the time period, the cultural artifacts, and even the fact that the body is missing may allow for such an avert, uh, assertion. Excuse me. Toward the end of the 12th dynasty, the status of Asiatic outsiders had declined, no doubt beginning a period of ethnic isolation. And by the end of the 13th dynasty, Asiatics in the Delta region took advantage of the waning power of the pharaoh and established their own rulership over parts of the Delta up to Hermopolis and Middle Egypt. Though some within the region were also controlled by lesser Asiatic groups making up the 16th dynasty or by Egyptian vassals. Now, the Hyksos somewhat continued Egyptian administrative tactics. They used Egyptian writing. They engaged Egyptians in their service. They rather strongly Egyptianized themselves, possibly in an attempt to legitimize their authority. And it may have been these fellow Asiatics who did not know Joseph and enslaved the Israelites, forcing them to build the Hyksos capital at Averis, a site that would eventually be named Pyramses. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this punctular time peek into the life of Joseph. As always, feel free to reach out to me if you need anything.